Uh, we're glad that you're here. We invite you now to give your mind to the Lord. I'll stand in the right place, start stay in my lane. Hey, this is the opportunity. Forget what, what, what got you here, whatever happened, getting ready, dragging kids out of the house, fighting, mean looks, all the things that happen on Sundays that we're supposed to say don't happen. They happen, don't they? Put that aside. Forget about what's going on after. That later on is going to take care of itself. And right now, give your heart and mind, praise God. If you don't know the songs, make up stuff. It's all right. It's make a noise, a joyful noise. And then listen to the word. Just give this time to God. Uh, Y'all, if you notice, we, you know, we are going to be celebrating our graduates this Sunday, this morning. But if you notice, we got on stage all youths. Uh, and not one responsible adult on the stage. And um, uh, this is, <laughs> did you see what I did there? But anyway, no, we got Keisha, our, our, our youth band, and man, y'all, just, just check this out. Just, hey, just worship together, right? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for loving us. We're here for you. This isn't, this isn't about us. It's about you. So help us get over ourselves for this moment offer ourselves as a gift of worship and praise. And Lord, we love you. Be with our young folks as they lead. Father, they're not entertaining us. They're leading us to worship you. They're the choir leaders today. We're the choir and you're the audience. Help us to worship you. We love you, Lord. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey, they left us wanting more, didn't they? We was kind of like, come on. Good job, y'all. Good job. I struggle with that. Um, I used to not, and then somebody brought to my attention when we say we're proud of this and proud of that. They say, well, you know, the Bible doesn't ever use the word proud in a positive way like that. And, uh, and the, the man was probably right that told me, and, but sometimes you just got to say, oh, oh well, uh, and say, you know, I'm proud of those. I'm proud of the youngins, and I'm proud of those who've worked with them uh, for so long, And uh, which kind of brings us to our next event here. Uh, we have, uh, we're going to recognize our graduates, uh, two of whom were up there in the band uh, playing. So I know we're going to have those two uh, to come forward. Uh, that's going to be uh, Trez and Rivers. Did they just go outside? They just went outside. I mean, they just flat out left right, right during that time. Yeah, come on up, Rivers. You did good. You earned that cookie. Trez, come on up. Trees. Um, I know uh, that we also have, uh, y'all just stand here for a second while we get the rest of the graduates up here. They might not be full out willing, but uh, we do have Miss Elizabeth Harris also graduated. Hmm? Didn't you graduate? Come on up here. All I can say for sure is your husband did not sign you up. Got you out of that one. Kevin did not sign you up. I promise. It was your brother-in-law. Yeah. It was, <laughs> I'm just saying. That's how that happened. Now, do we have any other? Those are, those are the three I know of that were here. And we're talking about for high school or college graduation. Uh, although we do want to say, uh, we, uh, you know, congratulations to everybody who got promoted out of kindergarten or first grade or all those things. For all y'all, we have a big hand. But... Yep. But for these, we have uh, we have something else. So um, we got it's almost hit or miss here. I think. Hey, Sarah, did you have things written in them? Yes, you did. Um, not here, but we will recognize is Rose Cranford. Rose isn't here, right? I didn't see Rose, but Rose is one of ours, and she graduated. Yes. Also, not represented today, I don't think, I didn't see her, was Brooke Tatum. And Brooke graduated also. We just congratulate Brooke. And Jonathan, her brother, also graduated, Jonathan Tatum. I hope these three are the, you know, we have, Elizabeth, you're going to be okay? You'll be all right. I see, hold on. This isn't going to be bad. It's not going to be bad. Elizabeth Harris, graduated from Ole Miss, is going into elementary education. Yes. So if one of these two are going to psychiatry, they can work. No, I'm just kidding. Congratulations. But don't run off, okay? And she's teaching at the upper elementary this next year. And she's teaching at the upper, yes. What Sarah said. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. We have Rivers Kissling, who graduated from Grenada High School and is going to boot camp in two weeks. Is that right? Yeah. He's going into the, the Army National Guard. He's going to be, uh, you know, we always want to pray for our troops, and that's, that's just one of those constants that we always want to do. Um, but we always, you know, when we know them, right, that, that ought to become an extra step. We pray for them. We, we see how in what ways we can support them uh, and encourage them. Uh, River's been here not close, not, not quite forever, uh, but close to forever. Uh, and God did a work in his life um, and his brother's life and his mama's life uh, that really uh, drew them into Christ's community uh, through Vacation Bible School that, that even though we didn't have it last year because of weirdness, we're going to have it this year because God works in people's lives in it. And uh, which is the reason why we want to have it. But God didn't stop working in River's life when he got saved. Uh, it was just a beginning. And he's become um, an increasingly fine young man uh, in behavior uh, and behavior. <laughs> and uh, 
He has a great personality, is what I'm saying. And uh, no, man, but I love you. And this is from the church. Anyway, love you, buddy. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> who we have left? Man, who? No, that. Oh no, is this? This is trees, uh, y'all. Uh, when uh, Trez hadn't been here quite as long as forever as Rivers has, but she's been here close to forever too. And um, I said, "What? What is your name?" They, man, people start talking about trees. Do you know? Don't you know trees? No, I don't know trees. Who's trees? I got no trees. And man, what we found out about about Trez and uh, and whose whose real name is Teresa Thornton, by the way, it's not. It's Therese. <laughs> Therese Thornton. We don't call her by that anyways. It's trees. Anyway, we love, uh, we love her. And um, she's been a part of our family. She is a princess of Christ Community Church. Uh, she has come up through our, our group uh, and, you know, was saved and, and, and baptized. Anyways, everything. Went to all this stuff with us. She is she, she has, if you belong to Christ Community Church, and I'd go further, if you belong to the Lord, Trez has had your back when you're at the school. Uh, Trez might be involved, might be responsible for Mr. Harris being here because he was always, he was always, she was always inviting. And Trez has a heart for people. Um, uh, Trez protects our people, you know, anyways. Uh, she's one, of, I don't see Levi. She's one of Levi's protectors. Uh, too, but anyways, we love Trez, and we're proud of her. I'm gonna use that word, we're proud of her, and we got this for you, anyways. We love you, and we're proud of you. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Hold on, I, I, I messed up. I told what everybody else was gonna do, but I didn't tell you what, what you're gonna do. What are you gonna do? Early childhood development and education. Early childhood development and education. So, you and Elizabeth are gonna be working together, Please. and um, but Trez has also started teaching a Sunday school class for youngins. Oh. First through third grade here on Sunday, okay? All right. Big round of applause, but, but we're not done. Oh, no. You graduate, we got to have a talent contest. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> come on over here in the middle. Y'all come, y'all huddle up here in the middle together, please. Did y'all get any, everybody get the pictures they wanted to get? All right, huddle up. No, not without, not, yeah, y'all together. Okay. Now, now, church, we need to remember that church isn't a place you come and sit, right? Sometimes you've got to be engaged. And what we're going to do is a holy, holy huddle around these folks. Uh, and we're just going to, just so come on, we're going to surround them and we're going to pray for them. So touch somebody that's touching somebody. Jamie, I'm going to ask if you come forward. Touch somebody that's touching somebody. We didn't need deodorant. Hey, and we're thankful. We're thankful for all these folks, but we're thankful for the people who, who raised them up, supported them, and all these things. Um, you know, we talk about Elizabeth graduating from, from Old Miss. She did so with a husband and two children. And um, uh, anyways, it's, there's people who, it's busy, and have been, uh, but they've been supported and loved. So we're going to pray, and I'm going to ask Jamie if he'll pray for us because... Uh, Jamie has been uh, our youth guy who got to see, um, you know, we mentioned, even the, the names of the people we mentioned who weren't here, uh, you know, Jamie played a big role in, in their heart and life. And I'm just going to ask Jamie if you would, if you would pray for our, our, our youth youngins. And then Keith Harris, since you volunteered your sister-in-law, you pray, <laughs> you pray too, okay, after Jamie. Jamie will open and Keith will close.
Thank you all. No talent show. Y'all can be seated. We were going to do the Macarena, but we decided not to. You won the talent show. Congratulations. All right. Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. And let's get ready for some hardcore Bible teaching. And Miss Nani's class. Ready, break. Otherwise, you will be in store for some hardcore Bible teaching. We're going to be in uh, 1 John chapter 1. Uh, we're, we're recommencing. You can go, baby. You got it. Oh, you got, Miss Sarah will take you. Miss Sarah will take you. Yeah. Nani's Miss Sarah's mama. I don't know what that, you know, hopefully that'll help. Make you feel, just so you know the relation. Uh, we're getting back into our, we're recommencing our Memorizing the, the God's Word series, and uh, we're going to add a verse to it. We're going to add 1 John 1, 9, which a lot of us already know, but part of the reason uh, I'd, uh, I'd love to see as we take the Lord's Supper at the end of service that this verse, 1 John 1, 9, gets packed into our minds when we taste the, the bread and the wine, the bread and the juice of communion, that it'll, it'll remind us of 1 John 1, 9. It'll remind us of the gospel, that we'll, we'll start taking some of these senses that God's given us and using it uh, for this memorization. Let me read this, and then we'll go through the uh, context of it, and we'll apply it, and we'll take the Lord's Supper together. Chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the opportunity we have to come celebrate our graduates, to hear your word and to dig in, and then to do what you told us to do, that as often as we take this supper to do it in remembrance of you. And so, Lord, we love you, and we give you all the praise, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's LG. I didn't know where LG was. I'm glad you're here. I had my eyes closed when I prayed, and I felt disoriented, not knowing exactly where you were in the room. But I'm back now. No, please don't move anymore. <laughs> LG is here. I was wondering. I, it just hit me all of a sudden. I was like, I have not seen LG today. And I looked over here, and he wasn't there. But he's there, and I feel better. Okay, 
Applying the context of this, uh, we're just going to look at the surrounding verses in the, uh, around verse 1, chapter 9, to get our mind right. And the first thing we need to do is receive the biblical witness about Jesus. Receiving the biblical witness about Jesus. Verses 1 through 4 say basically two things. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, really came to earth. He's the real deal. We saw him. We heard him. We handled him. We touched him. You know, we were there with him. You know, any ideas that Jesus is a myth, that it's a fairy tale, that the gospel is based on, you know, that it could somehow be true and effective, but, you know, just a story, just something that makes us feel good. That's not, that's not the witness of the Bible. The witness of the Bible is that Jesus Christ came in reality. He's the Son of God, the life, the eternal life from heaven that's manifested to us. And we're hearing from an eyewitness, the Apostle John. And he's like, y'all, he was here for real. So don't miss that. Man, we need to receive that. There ain't no sense in confessing our sins to a God that's not real. Not only does it say he came for real, but by implication, it tells us that he is alive forever. Not only because it says he is that eternal life, but I want you to hear what it says in verse 3. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That is present tense. Our fellowship is now with Jesus Christ. By implication, that means this. Just like we're alive, just like God's alive, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, guess what? He's alive. He's been raised from the dead. So when we get this in its context, this letter is strong. It starts off with, you need to know Jesus is the real deal. He used his past experience. We've seen, heard, and handled him in the past, but he uses his present fellowship. We still have a relationship, an ongoing fellowship with the living Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all, this is the way it should be with us too in experience and practice. Most people I talk to, I talk to them about the Lord. Man, do you have a relationship with the Lord? And I say, yeah, you know, when I was eight, I came down and I gave my life to Christ at XYZ Church. And, you know, and I said, that's, that's awesome. And I said, do you have a relationship with the Lord? And they're like, uh, yeah, I just told you. When I was eight, I came down. And I'm like, that's great, but now you're 48. You know, what's going on today? Do you have a fellowship with the Lord? Amen to looking back and saying you gave your life to Christ, that he did a work in your life, that you're born again, that you're saved. Does Jesus save eight-year-olds? He does. Praise God for that. Praise God for how he rescues folks at an early age. But you know, we're not meant to only have a past experience with God. We're meant to have a present experience, a present fellowship with God, a present walking with God and talking with God. God's meant to bring joy in our life, not because of what he did way back when, but because of what he's doing now in you. He says here, our fellowship is is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy might be full, that you might receive the truth of who Jesus is and walk with Him, have fellowship with Him now. A dead Savior can't save, y'all. A dead Lord can't lead. You, if you say, Jesus is my best friend, that has to be present tense. Otherwise, it's not worth talking about, okay? It needs to be now. We have a past experience, but we have a present fellowship with God. When we look at this context, we need to understand God's holy character. God is holy. He's completely different than we are, y'all. Verse 5 makes that stand out. It says about God, this is the message that we have heard from him and we declare to you that God is is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is light. This idea of purity, this idea of wholesome, innocent holiness, God is perfect in that. 
There is not a little bit of sin in the Lord. There's not a little bit of corruption in the Lord. There's not a little bit of darkness. In the original language, this sentence is really awkward. It says, in him is, he is light, God is light, and in him is, uh, there is no darkness, no, none, not. It's like, oh, okay. What's going on there? He's emphasizing it. There is no shade or variation in God. He is pure, unadulterated holiness. He is perfect. I say that, you might say, well, we assume that of God. I, I don't know if we always do. Mankind is great at putting God into our image, into our character, and assuming that God's looking for shortcuts, that God's limited on a lot of things, that God's always looking for stuff. Another way I think that we don't get that about God is there's a lot of disgruntled people in this world, maybe even in this church. If you're really disgruntled, raise your hand. No, I'm just kidding. I, yeah, I, knew, I, knew, I'd get, I knew I'd get some. Uh, the honest ones. And, uh, and they, here's, what, here's, here's their line of thinking. This world is corrupt. Did you see what they did? Do you know what the president did? Do you know what his cabinet did? Do you know what that party did? Do you know how they cheated this? Do you know how they did that? Do you see how they escaped justice? How do we do this? What's going on? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So obviously you hunger and you thirst for righteousness. What you want is a complete just world. Something where everything is just smack dab right on, right? That's what you want. Well, listen, I got good news for you. That exists in God. What you're looking for, what your gripe centered, sitting, you know, it just always itching and yelling at the TV about something, what it's looking for is perfect holiness, righteousness, and justice. Well, it don't exist on the news, y'all. It don't exist in the party you don't vote for, and it don't exist in the party you vote for. It don't even exist in your house. It don't even exist in your heart. Because truth is, if you really wanted justice and righteousness to be held to the line across for everybody, it's going to hit you in a place you don't like to. But if you long to see somebody who's actually right and loving and 100% honest, truthful, down to the core, it's God. Let God be your hero. Look to Christ, who is perfect in everything. Stop looking at the world, unless you just like to gripe. And if you like to gripe, get good at it. Stop being like whiny. When you whine, people shut you out because you're a whiner. What you need to do is you need to hone your arguments with sophisticated human reasoning so that you at least sound intelligent when you whine. And then someone will listen. That's if you just like to gripe. But if you really want righteousness and justice, look to God. He's perfect. He's perfect in every way. Look to God, not to man. God is perfect. He is light. In him there is no darkness, no not none, never no. Uh-uh. He's different than us. Got to understand that. Learning to fellowship with God while we're struggling with sin. Here's one of those. Here's what, what chapter 1, verse 9 is really about. It's that God is holy. We are not. How is it that we can have fellowship with him? And we're going to look at that in a minute when we get to verse 9. But just to say, we've got to come the way God says to come. We come the way, God has set up a way for us to have fellowship with him, even though we're not perfect. Do you all know anybody perfect? I mean, we've got Doc Richardson. He's close as it gets. I don't know. He and LG arm wrestle for perfection. Who wins will never know. No, but... God is perfect and we're not, but he has made a way for us to have fellowship with him. And that's what we're going to talk about when we get to the sermon. This is the pre-ramble. <laughs> Last thing we need to see in the context. In the context, we need to see this. We need, and Christian folks, please remember, this. all this is written to a Christian people. Okay? So they struggled with sin and all these things, but we need... 
as a priority to learn how to trust the perfect work of what Jesus Christ has done. For all us sad sack, down in the mouth, hanging low, defeated Christians, we need to look at Jesus Christ and realize what he's done is perfect. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. He didn't say almost, kind of, wished it was finished. This is part, I'm putting a down payment down upon your salvation, upon which you can build on with the good works in your life because I just couldn't do it all. You know how we say all the time, I just can't do it all? Well, Jesus can do it all. He did it all. He took your sin and my sin and made perfect forgiveness and fellowship with God possible. We need to trust him in that. So when we sin, we come back to this. We do what it says in 1 John 1, 9, but we do it understanding what it says right here in chapter, one, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Hey, and not ours only. This is the basis of missions too. Not ours only, but for the world. So that when we look at people, we ought not write them off. We ought not dismiss the fact that God can do a work in their life. We ought not judge them based on the sin that we see in their life. Because we know that if they turn to Christ, all that is gone. All that is taken away. These are the things we need to know from the context of these verses. We need to, we need to receive that biblical witness. We need to appreciate the character of God, that he didn't change his character to bring us into the kingdom. He's going to change our character. He's going to change us. That's why we're born again. That's why we're saved, so that he brings us in. We need to understand he gives us a way, and we need to trust that Christ's work is perfect. Now, let's look at this gospel, what I'm calling the gospel spirituality, gospel spirituality and integrity. Gospel spirituality and integrity starts where we are, sinners. Who is it that confesses their sin? Sinners. Somehow or another, we've gotten to where we don't want to call anybody a sinner. We think sinners are the really bad people. The really, really bad ones. Not like us. And then I'm like, hold on, man. We're at Christ Community Church. I pastor the really bad sinners. So if you don't think you're a really bad sinner, and you're here, maybe you've made a mistake. Because, see, this is a place where we say, yeah, I know that I've done bad. I know that I've sinned. I did it on purpose with my eyes open a hundred times in a row, and I know that I can't save myself, and I need God to save me. This is the place where we're not going to shy away from calling people sinners. Levi and I were listening to a podcast, and they had this interview with all these famous preachers and uh, Christian musicians and all these things, and they're being interviewed, and they kept getting asked this hot topic sin question, okay? Uh, I almost hate to say it because as soon as you say it, it takes over the whole conversation, but I'll say it anyways. They're being asked about homosexuality. Do you believe homosexuality is a sin? These were preachers, authors, musicians, all of whom you would know, none of whom I'm going to tell you. And one after another, they said, we don't know. Can't tell you whether it's a sin or not. And then one kind of said, halfway, yes, it's kind of like a sin. And the interviewer said this. If you believe that's a sin, don't you know there's people in your congregation who are going to feel like they're sinners? And the pastor recoiled. Oh, well, I don't really deal with that stuff. I don't really deal with it. So this is what I want to do. I'm going to take that hot button topic off the board, okay? And I want to talk to the congregation right here. And I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, based on the word of God, that y'all, every last one, young and old, rich and poor, black and white, thick and thin, 
tall and short. You all sinners. Every last one of you. And can I tell you something? Christ came into the world to save sinners. So if you're not, I don't know how you can be saved. Only in a pretend way. Only in a pretend way where people pretend not to be sinners. You pretend to be saved. Only way to be saved is if we come to God and we confess our sins. That's how you get saved, y'all. That's how God works. I just need you to know. I need you to know that your pastor's a sinner. I ain't going to tell you all the sins that I commit. But I need you to know that I'm a sinner. And I was born in sin. My mama was there. It, <laughs> uh, man, we have, we, have tried to, we have tried to clean it up. Christ community is not the church where you come to because you cleaned up. It's the place where we come and we get real with God. This verse is as real as you get. If we confess our sins. Let's talk about reasons why people don't. Before I believed in God, I never confessed sin. I got some advice from my dad back in the day. He said, boy, never tell on yourself. Seemed to make sense to me. I figured if I didn't tell, I wasn't going to get caught. Even when I got caught, I've told you that story about how my mama caught me in a lie, and I told her one story, and she, trying to be gracious to me, said, John, why don't you try another one? At which time I did. At that time, not only trying to be gracious, but baffled at how stupid her son was, said, John, why don't you try another one? At which point I did. I figured maybe there's one she ain't heard. And she finally said, this boy ain't going to cooperate. She said, John, I already know. I already know what happened. If you would have just confessed, you wouldn't have got any trouble. I ended up getting in more trouble than the guy who was really in trouble because I lied about the trouble. I say all that to say, you know, we learned some bad habits about confessing sin. As Christian people, the biggest hypocrisy that we show is not that we sin, it's that we don't run to God with our sin. See, being a Christian is not defined by not having sin. Being a Christian is defined by having a perfect Savior. So what's the hypocrisy? That you've made a mistake? That you've sinned? No. It's that you're hesitant to go to the perfect Savior you say you believe in. I believe Jesus died for our sins. So is that why you're burdened with unconfessed sin? Well, but that's different. It's different because you're embarrassed, because you're prideful. And my guess is you have a faith problem. When you believe that God is your Savior, that Christ is perfect, it follows that you'll confess your sins to God. Confess your sins. Other reason we don't confess is because our conscience becomes seared, cauterized, hardened by repeated sin. We get into a lifestyle of sin. And at first it, it made us, you know, oh, we said words that made us cringe. We did things that made us cringe. We drank things. We smoked things. We watched things that made us cringe. But after a while, hey, that pesky old conscience, it's done left me alone. It don't bother me anymore. I know what God's word says, but don't you think he would have been convicting me? It's like, honey, you, your heart has become hard. You have calluses all over your heart. Your conscience has been seared. That's why you don't feel anymore. That's why God in the Old Testament says, I'm going to give them a new heart. I'm going to take that stone heart out of them. And I'm going to give them a heart of flesh, a heart that actually feels and works and loves me. Man, we get into this place where our conscience is seared. We stop confessing sins. Things that early on in our Christianity would have bothered the stew out of us. We lay our heads on a pillow now and sleep sound. Why? Because we've gotten into it and our conscience has become seared, so we don't confess our sin. Another reason we don't confess our sin is because we deceive ourselves. Matter of fact, this is right here in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I don't know about y'all, but self-deception is one of the worst deceptions you can ever get into. Somebody can deceive you. They can say, I love you, and then the next breath they can rob you. They can love you forever while they're walking out the door. And they can break your heart. See how I did that? They can wound your feelings. 
They can make you feel real bad because they lied to you. Well, you know why they did, right? Because they're liars. But if you lie to you, when you lie to you about your sin, when you deceive yourself, when you break your heart, who's there to, to lead you back right? Who's there to console you late at night? Who's there to help you? If you turn on you, that's hard to get out of. Man, you're going to need God. You're going to need God to tap you on the shoulder and say, Honey, you believe in a lie. You've deceived yourself. Some people are just ignorant of sin. Some people might not know that God has a design for our sexuality. I mean, think about it. There's a whole generation of people being raised up in schools. Now, I'm not saying every school and every teacher, but there's a whole generation being brought up in a sense of not being taught what real sexuality is, being taught a human, ordained, and thought-out sexuality. They might not even know that God's Word speaks against it or speaks to it. They might not got... There's a whole bunch of overeaters. Raise your hand if you're an overeater. I was kidding. <laughs> I don't mean to be like that, but look, for real, God's Word does say gluttony is what? It's a what? What is it? Sin. There's all kind. You know, there's two kinds of sinners in this world. There's the prodigal son who took everything and wasted it. And kind of stuff. But you know, there's another kind of sinner in this world, the older brother, who in his self-righteousness judged the other brother and disregarded the father. Guess what? Whatever kind of sinner you are, you need the father. You need to confess your sin. If you're ignorant of it, you think, well, I didn't ever do any of those things. I ain't drank, I ain't smoked, I ain't cussed, I ain't done anything those weird loser sinners have done. <laughs> Maybe you're that older brother. Maybe you need to have your heart softened too. Maybe you're ignorant of it. A lot of people grow up in church and grow to be self-righteous. Religion will make you self-righteous in a fast minute. Maybe that's what you need to repent of and confess your sins about. Then there's just lies. We just lie to ourselves. We lie about God. If we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar. <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. Why should we confess our sin? Just three reasons real quick why we should. One, because we get, uh, we, we, because we do believe. Because we do believe Christ. Because we have faith that he'll forgive us when we've confessed. Number two, because the Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit convicting you is like somebody knocking at the door. Hold on, somebody's knocking at my door. It's like, hold on, somebody's knocking at the door. Hey, I'm just going to, uh, somebody keeps knocking at the door. You know, the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin. And when he knocks on the door, man, answer the door. Right? Be when you come under the conviction, when God says that's wrong, you don't got to, you, you don't got to go into the corner and, 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 and beat yourself with a belt and cry, get Close your eyes, bow your head, and confess your sin to God right where you are. He's alive. He hears you. He's the one knocking at your door. When he convicts you, repent. Confess. Last one is love. I like this one. I need this one. Because in this world, I'm prone to love me more than I love anybody or anything else. That's being honest. It's self-love. Uh, the Bible says in the last time, and I, I, it's not my mom's fault uh, in, in raising me. I've just, I'm a selfish individual. I think about me more than I think about anybody else. That includes my wife or my kids or you or the Lord even sometimes because I'm selfish. I need a love greater than the love I have for me to develop and grow for God so that when I sin, I'll confess my sins because losing that love, losing that fellowship with him would be more than I can bear. You know, we sing sometimes songs that sound romantic and we talk about God being the great lover of our soul. Well, he is. We talk about how God so loved the world that he came to rescue us. Well, he did. And when our love for him grows to the point where we say, you know what? I don't need anything else. I'm looking for him, and he's the highest love in my life. When something happens between us and him, when we sin, when, not if, but when we sin, we're going to be quick to confess it because we love him. Because we love him. 
You know what the Bible says? If you love God, what you do? What does it say? How do we show our love for God? We keep His word, His commandment. We love Him back. We confess our sin. Those are the reasons why we confess. If we confess our sin, this is on us. That's about the last time you're going to hear me say that. But God convicts us. God shows us and God tells us. But I believe it's on us to confess. We confess our sin. And guess what happens when that? God hears us and God begins a work in us. The next phrase says, He is faithful and just. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I want to talk about that word, faithful and just. Because I want you to think about this. I'm going to put us in a bad scenario. I'm going to put, put myself in a bad scenario because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, okay? Uh, because, real, we need to talk about this, this for real, okay? Let's say, uh, and God forbid, that somebody, as my, my and this is a hypothetical, as my, uh, let's say, we'll just use Josh because I don't see him because he's working. He's at the fire department. Hey, good, I get to use him. Let's say Josh has a really beautiful wife someday, and they're, they're, they're all good. But one of the officials in town who just thinks he can own everything and own everybody decides to take and have an affair with his wife. And he gets his wife pregnant, and in order to cover up, he kills my son, Josh, to cover that up. And then he marries my former daughter-in-law, and they have a child, and that child dies which really by right should have been my grandchild, but he was taken from me because of this person's selfishness and greed. Now, they say, well, you know, he's been forgiven by God. and He'll be all taken care of. The slate's clean. How do you reckon I'm going to feel? How do I feel? I'm going to put you in that scenario in a real life scenario, right? I just wanted to bring it to modern times. But David, who is the king of Israel, killed Uriah to have his wife to cover up a pregnancy. How are you going to explain to Uriah's daddy why his son was murdered by the king to get his wife? How are you going to explain to Bathsheba's daddy how his first grandchild is now dead because of the, sin, the sins of the king who took his daughter from her husband? And killed him. How, how, how are you going to explain that at the family reunion? You just get to say, okie day, because you're the king, and I guess you just get away with stuff. How can God, the righteous judge of the world, let that guy go with killing and adultery and cover-up? How can he do it? How can he be faithful and just? Then let's extrapolate it down. How can he be faithful and just to forgive me? Because I've sinned. Not in the same sins of David, but I've certainly sinned on purpose with malicious intent, with eyes wide open. And you know what I know about y'all? Y'all have sinned with malicious intent, with eyes wide open, no mistake. How can a just God forgive you? How? Explain it. Explain it to Uriah's daddy. Why is my son dead and it's okay with God? Was it okay with God? So why wasn't David struck down? Why weren't his wives stolen? Well, they ended up being, but why? Why wasn't he struck down? Because even in that time, God had a way. God had a way for sinners to approach a sinless God. And it's still that way today. And it's by faith. When the person puts faith in God... God imputes to their character righteousness. And y'all, David couldn't have known. He saw only vaguely, but we know how God does it. We look at the cross, and we know that the justice of God, that sin must be punished, and the grace of God meet at the cross. So that sin is punished on Jesus, and grace is distributed to sinners who don't deserve it. That's how he does it. But when that saying says he is faithful and just to forgive sinners, there's got to be a way only God could work out. <clears throat> if I sat on a human court and David came in 
And I said, well, you're the king. I'm just going to let you go. That's neither faithful nor just. But if someone says his sin has been paid for in a way that completely satisfies the court, in a way that completely satisfies all justice, then we can do it. And that's what God did in Christ. He is faithful. He is just. He is the justifier of those who have sinned, and he is the just God who judges sin appropriately. He is perfect. Remember we said he was perfect? There's no way he let David's sin slide. Jesus Christ paid for David's sin. There's no way he lets my sin slide. Jesus Christ paid for my sin. There is no way he's going to let your sin slide. Jesus Christ paid for your sin if you put your faith in him. It don't go away until you put your faith in him. When you do, it does go away. This last line actually says, he forgives us our sins <clears throat> and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That word forgive has the idea of it, he sends it away. He paid for it. He canceled the debt. He sends it away. He releases it. He lets it go. It's gone. The Psalms say as far as the east is from the west, it's gone. In the sea of forgetfulness, it's gone. Because Christ did a perfect work in forgiving our sins. He completely satisfied God on our behalf. So the forgiveness we receive, it's like it's not even there. It don't have to be a sponge because it's gone. It's obliterated. David asked in Psalm 51, Obliterate my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. They are obliterated. They're gone. That's what it means to be forgiven, y'all. That's why it's called good news. This is why I call it good news spirituality. Because we come in with, laden with sin, but we come to a God who's perfect in forgiveness and we walk out free, unburdened, new, renewed. What happens if we sin again? Come back, confess, get right with him. Walk in the light as he's in the light. Fellowship with him presently. Those are the things we do. We allow him to do that work. I like to call that work repentance, especially that last line. Who forgives us our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Y'all, for too long, we've seen repentance as a sweaty human labor to try to change our mind about the things we like. I'd sure like to stop smoking, but I just can't because I like it. I wish I could stop drinking, but I can't because I'm drunk. Uh, I wish I could stop eating at the buffet, but I can't because it's good. You know, and for a while, we like... You know, I'm just using those examples, but we kind of white-knuckle it. We're like, oh, man, I'm going to change my mind. And, and we call that repentance. We get all sweaty and, and just nasty, and we're like, oh, I'm going to do different. I'm going to do different. I'm going to do different. Lie, you ain't going to do no different. You're going to hold out for 15, 20 minutes. And then all of a sudden, you're going to justify exactly doing what you want to do. Man, if God doesn't do a, war, a work in your heart, your heart's not going to change. God's got to do a work in your brain. Or your brain's not going to change. What this work is, it's the same thing that we looked at from last week in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew in me a steadfast spirit, O God. Purge me of my sins, O God. Make me to hear righteousness and joy again in the bones you broke, O God. Uphold me by your generous spirit, O God. Restore me, O God. God is doing the work. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness, O God. When does that work happen? That work, believe me, God's ready to do it, but that work depends on us. We come to God, we confess our sin to God, and we yield our life to God. We don't march in and grab him by the hair and tell him he better start cleansing us. You better cleanse me, boy. It ain't going to happen like that. We get honest with God. We have a gospel spirituality, being honest and having integrity, knowing that we're a sinner, yielding ourselves to God, letting God do that work. Now we're going to have the Lord's Supper. We're going to have it right now while this verse is in our head. We're going to say that verse together. You all already know it probably. 
but we're going to put it in our mind. And as we take the Lord's Supper, I want to juxtapose that verse in your brain. I want to bring it into, into contact with that taste in your mouth of the Lord's Supper. Because I want you to remember. I want you to, to have a feeling behind it and a memory behind it so that you'll say, you know what? When I sin, I know that God has a way for me to walk with Him. I get honest about my sin and confess it, and then I allow God to take it away and do this work in my life. And it tastes like matzah bread and grape juice. <laughs> it should. One of the clearest depictions of the gospel is in the Lord's Supper. It's so simple. He gave His body for your sin. He gave His blood for your sin. And you trust Him. So for everyone who trusts Him, we invite you to come forward in, in a moment. Uh, and we're going to take this Lord's Supper together. If there's a cracker in here again, I'm going to fall out. Okay. There's not. There's, there's these little squares of bread, unleavened bread. This is going to represent the body of Christ right now. God, our Father, gave his son, and on the, on, the, on the night he was betrayed, when they were celebrating the redemption dinner, which that is what Passover is, a celebration of the redemption from Egypt. As they were celebrating redemption dinner, he took, he took a loaf of unleavened bread. You've got to use your imagination here. And he broke it, which is, yeah, that's broken. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Father God, thank you for giving us your son, because I can't think of anyone who would give their son, now no loving parent, who would offer their son to have their body broken. My mom wouldn't. Uh, but, Lord, you did what no one else could or should do. It wouldn't matter if my mom did because I can't fit the bill of Christ. Jesus is the only one. His body is broken for us, and we give you thanks. Also in the night, um, in, the, in the cup after supper, which stands for redemption, they would have had four cups in, the, in that memorial service. The cup after supper was redemption, and Jesus took that cup and said, this is the covenant this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you, given for you. It's a reminder of what God did for us. And so as we take it, we remember what God did for us. Lord, you gave your son to shed his blood that we might have a way back to you. And we love you, Lord. We give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Michael, would you help me? And uh, who we got? Jason, would you help me? And LG, would you help me? Christ, this is a way of reminding you that he's closer than a brother. It's a way of reminding you that he died for you, and he's perfect in what he did, okay? But if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ, can I tell you something? He stands ready to save. He stands ready to save us. He says, if, man, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes... On the repentance with the mouth confession is made. On the salvation for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here today and you don't know if you're saved, man, that'd be like not knowing if the floor is really lava or not. Remember the kids used to play that? Anyway, man, uh, the way they would explain it in the old times is like you dangling over a fire just hanging by a spider web thick rope because life can end in a moment. If you're not right with God, do you really want to go on in that state? Man, make things right with God, because not because you can make him do it, but because he's offered in Christ, okay? But this is for everyone who knows Christ.
if we can put it on the thing. And you'll come to the bread first and then the cup. But uh, can we pull it up on there? There we go. We can read it. Ready on three. One, two, three. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That was a test right there. Good job. Okay.